and recount. Officials in Georgia are set to certify the results of the state's presidential election. We have reaction. Coronavirus crisis. New developments in the race to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Focus on China. Lawmakers are questioning Beijing over possible human rights violations against a religious minority. And Oh Christmas Tree, a sign of the Yuletide season arrives in the nation's capital. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, November 20th, 2020. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. The White House tells EWTN News Nightly President Donald Trump's pro-life accomplishments aren't going anywhere no matter who is in office come January. Also today, Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany held her first press briefing since October 1st. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. President Donald Trump appeared today to discuss lowering drug prices. Earlier, his press secretary, Kelly McEnany, held an at times tense news conference, telling one reporter she doesn't call on activists. The president's been very clear. He wants every legal vote to be counted uh, and to make sure no illegal votes are counted. And when it comes to smooth transitions of power. While in 2016, President Trump became the duly elected president, Many sought to undermine him, discredit him, delegitimize him, and deny his victory. There were no calls for unity. There were no calls for healing. Presumptive President-elect Joe Biden's spokesperson demands the White House start sharing information with the incoming administration. A smooth transition uh, and uh, a, a period of transition where the president-elect, the vice president-elect, uh, national security officials and experts, experts who are helping us get the pandemic under control, have access to the information they need, is, is essential for our democracy and for our country. Meanwhile, in Georgia, the Secretary of State there says Joe Biden won by more than 12,000 votes out of about 5 million cast. Working as an engineer throughout my life, I live by the motto that numbers don't lie. As Secretary of State, I believe that the numbers that we have presented today are correct. President Trump continues to push ahead while he's still in office. He spoke today on drug prices. Big Pharma ran millions of dollars of negative advertisements against me during the campaign, which I won, by the way, but, you know, we'll find that out. Meanwhile, the White House tells me, quote, President Trump's pro-life leadership will continue to have a lasting impact for years to come. They hope future presidents will follow his example of attending the March for Life. And in Wisconsin, that state's election recount got started today. Initial results show Joe Biden won the Badger State by more than 20,000 votes. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. We are also keeping our eyes on the nation's closest, closest congressional race, where a recount is underway to see who will represent Iowa's second congressional district in the U.S. House. Fewer than just 50 votes separate Republican candidate Dr. Marinette Miller-Meeks from her Democratic opponent, Rita Hart. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Miller-Meeks about the state of the race and the importance of her Catholic faith. Dr. Marinette Miller-Meeks joins me now on Skype. Dr. Miller-Meeks, thank you so much for being here. Um, this race is very close, so close, in fact, that some have not officially called it, and there's actually a recount underway. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yes, the process in Iowa uh, for recount, uh, all there's 24 counties in the 2nd Congressional District, and on um, November 10th, all counties had to do their canvas and their audit and then they had to have the Board of uh, Supervisors certify those results. That process has already taken place. And uh, at the end of that process, I am ahead of my opponent by uh, 47 votes and the unofficial winner of this election. However, your opponent can call for a recount, an official recount, which they've done. And that recount is made up of a recount board. So each campaign gets to select one person. And then there's a third person. And if the two campaigns can't agree on the third person, a district judge appoints a person. We're in that process now of this recount process. And hopefully through this recount process, it will show what, uh, what has already been shown before, which was that I'm ahead of my opponent. And that hopefully soon by November 30th, which in Iowa code, uh, you're supposed to have a credentialing as the winner and I'll be declared the winner of this election and then be able to uh, to join uh, the 117th Congress here in Washington, D.C. in January. What's this process been like for you? 
Uh, it certainly is a very stressful process. Campaigns in and of themselves are very stressful being out in the public um, and, you know, in very different circumstances with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, how much you could do in public. But we door knocked. We would meet with people respecting social distancing and wearing masks. Um, but it's a very stressful process uh, for yourself and especially for your family members and especially when you're, uh, you're being attacked. And sometimes you're attacked on your faith as well, too. Uh, so I think the process is a stressful one, but we know that uh, that the outcome, the ability to affect policy and what we have facing our country, especially this election, is extre extremely important. Uh, the um, you know freedom of assembly, freedom to practice your religious faith, those things I think were really highlighted in this election uh, time period uh, in uh, that haven't been in any other time period. The, the opposing parties' uh, viewpoints on abortion and life is another extraordinarily important issue, and so I think this uh, I think this election was really a very important election on many fronts and many issues, uh, and I think um, that helps motivate you to continue to work hard to know that you can make a difference when you're in Congress. Uh, quickly, I, I'd like to let our viewers know a little bit more about you. Can you talk about your background um, as a veteran, a medical doctor, and a public health official, and also the role that your Catholic faith has played in all of that? Well, I'm uh, the fourth of eight children. My father was a master sergeant in the Air Force. My mom had gotten a GED. Both my parents worked to support their uh, eight children. Both my parents were Catholic, um, and they raised their children in the Catholic faith. And so that's a uh, played a very important role both in my uh, personal life and in my public life. Um, I married a non-Catholic, but uh, he has uh, converted to our faith, and our children were raised Catholic as well, too. When I was 15, I was severely burned in a kitchen fire, and um, I got an epiphany, and I knew that my pathway that God had chosen for me was to become a medical doctor. Having uh, no one in the family ever gone to, uh, to uh, college, uh, my parents didn't know how to navigate that or to help me, although they were both very intelligent and self-educated people. So I actually left home at 16. I uh, got a job. I enrolled in San Antonio Junior College. I enlisted in the Army at age 18, and I just kept working at night and going to school during the day until I got a degree in nursing, a master's in education. Ultimately, I was able to get a medical degree and become a physician. I also stayed in the military and spent 24 years both active duty and reserve, going from enlisted to lieutenant colonel when I retired after 24 years in the military. And throughout all of that process, I think my faith really helped me to navigate through uh, unforeseen circumstances, through through failures, through mistakes, through obstacles, uh, and really provided for me the grit and uh, tenacity that I needed to succeed. Um, and so I think having that faith and that hope uh, that you can overcome circumstances and that, you know, obstacles and failures don't define who they are. They just make a stronger character, really helped support me all throughout my life and throughout this process of the election and the campaign as well. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of that with us. Please keep us posted. Uh, Dr. Marinette Miller-Meeks, thanks again. Thank you so much. A Pfizer is seeking emergency authorization to use its COVID-19 vaccine as early as next month. The company added German partners say the vaccine appears to be 95 percent effective. The Archbishop of Portland, Oregon, is speaking out against the Democratic governor's new measures to combat COVID-19, which include limiting attendance at religious services. In a letter to the faithful yesterday, Archbishop Alexander Sample says in part, quote, why are we limited to 25 people in a church that can seat 1,000 while well, certain businesses are allowed to operate on a percentage of capacity? The leader of the Serbian Orthodox Church has died after being diagnosed with COVID-19. In a statement, the church says Patriarch Arenish died in a hospital in Belgrade. The 90-year-old urged close relations with Russia and often criticized Western policies towards Serbia. The Serbian government has called for three days of mourning. Coming up, why lawmakers are urging the U.N. Secretary General to investigate China's behavior against Uyghur Muslims. And a young Bosnian refugee shares how her faith has carried her through every hardship.
20 bipartisan lawmakers are joining an international call for action. They want the U.N. Secretary General to step in and end communist China's human rights abuses and religious persecution of Uyghur Muslims. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric. That's right, Tracy. The U.S. State Department has condemned the United Nations for its lack of action and concern over the widespread human rights abuses taking place in the northwest region of China. Now, senators on both sides of the aisle, along with congressmen on both sides of the aisle, they're joining forces, and they say that the time for words is over, and it's time for the U.N. to take action. I think letters like this really help improve the dialogue. In a two-page letter this week, four senators from both parties joined 16 bipartisan House lawmakers in writing to the U.N. Secretary General. They say he is, quote, intimately aware of human rights violations of millions of Uyghurs and other minorities. The U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom tells me this has to stop. It is shocking that China would sit on the uh, Human Rights Council. This is one of the greatest perpetrators of human rights abuses in the world today. And Ambassador Brownback explains the communist government intensely monitors its citizens to control their behavior. Well, you get a social credit score. And if you go to church or if you go to a mosque, you get downgraded on that for being a religious extremist. And then if people contact you on their cell phones, they get downgraded on their social credit score because of you. So that creates this peer pressure to get away from your faith community. And just what, how they treat uh, the Uyghur population and, and, and how they treat Christians and anybody that has believes in a supreme being, uh, they treat them horribly. Senator Rick Scott of Florida is one of the senators to sign the letter. He tells me it's important to act now. We need to help the people of China get a better government. The way to do that is stop buying products from Communist China, highlight their abuses of Christians and Muslims and Uyghurs, everybody. Ambassador Brownback says it's important to keep in mind that this communist country has been committing these human rights abuses for more than seven decades. Officials there have burned down Catholic churches and even desecrated statues. Tracy. Okay, thank you, Eric. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill tonight. The problem of religious persecution in China, Iraq, and Africa was the focus of a symposium yesterday as advocates for religious freedom met virtually to talk about the need to protect Christians around the world. Joining me now on Skype is Mariam Ibrahim, one of the speakers at yesterday's event and a survivor of religious persecution. She is also director of global mobilization and co-founder of the Tahrir Al-Nisa Foundation, which serves women and children impacted by domestic abuse and religious persecution. Miriam, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know the dangers of religious persecution firsthand. Can you tell us about your experience as a persecuted Christian in Sudan and then also how your faith helped to sustain you during that time? Amen. Faith is always holding us through everything we go through. So his divine power has given us everything we need for life. So my um, story is similar to a million story of women and other persecuted believers around the world. And um, Sudan is something thing is getting much better right now, but for our other countries, Nigeria and Somalia and Eritrea, Ethiopia, even Egypt. So I've seen all these things um, and um, it's heartbreaking things, but the same time, I'm very thankful for the effort of the prayer and the advocacy. So there's so much work and there's so much work need to be done on behalf of those persecuted believers. Can you talk a little bit about what the conditions are like right now for Christians living in the Sudan? Well, um, the problem is about the law and some other, we still have an issue with other Muslim extremist groups that are arguing in case of um, like abolishing apostasy laws, there's too many uh, debates and uh, people are divided on whether we do this or not. 
And we still have an issue with persecution, even for Muslims, when we see some change in the law affect the Muslims as well in terms of alcohol, drinking alcohol. And in this case, is uh, drinking alcohol and making alcohol. When I was in prison, most of the women in prison are Muslim who have been charged with some crime that's related to making a local wine. And this is actually the part of their, like, an income. They do this as a job to take care of their family. But the government sees them as a criminal. So they will charge with different crimes. They will charge with, uh, or they will charge with being flogged. They fine. This is still going. This is still still um, a part of the law, in the court system, in the law system. This is not being changed. And my concern is the same thing that we have people with all is supposed to see law, but to still have people go to jail and be sentenced and get fined and flogged for their religion because they are Muslim. And, and this is um, actually uh, it's like a social service uh, <laughs> work, like. Those people need to have jobs. They need to have an income to take care of this woman, need to take care of their family. But because they make the local wine, they just see their own doing. So instead of uh, helping them get through things or find another solution to their issue, they've been charged with crime. I remember some women will come into jail, like their kids being left at the home alone. And most of those women actually came like from Nuba Mountain and that point, the war, the conflict zone and war zone so they lost their spouses they lost their families members and they are like single mothers that have to depend on themselves to take care of their children but they find themselves on jail or in prison so yeah the other thing is we still have an issue with the church uh, lands or christian schools is being taken by the old regime and is not returned to the to their uh, owner like school, um, many different churches. Uh, my former Sudanese lawyer, they're still taking those kids in the uh, Sudanese court right now. Yep. Well, Mariam, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us and, and, and bringing awareness to this issue. We wish we had more time. We'll have to have you back on uh, again. Mariam Ibrahim, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. So much, I appreciate you. Up next, the beauty of faith. A look at how tomorrow's Feast of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary is displayed in art. And it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas in our nation's capital. The Capitol Christmas tree arrived in Washington, D.C. today. Known as the People's Tree, the Colorado Ingleman Spruce is 55 feet tall. The traditional lighting ceremony will take place next month, but because of the ongoing pandemic, crowds will not be able to attend. Tomorrow, we celebrate the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary when Mary's parents presented her in the temple in Jerusalem. Joining me now on Skype to help us examine this feast day through art is Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Jem, welcome back. So good to see you again. So tell us, what is the origin of the feast of the presentation of Mary? How is it depicted in this painting? Thank you, Tracy, and it's good to be back. You know, in the second chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, we are told that Mary and Joseph present the baby Jesus in the temple when he was 40 days old. And they offer turtle doves according to the Jewish custom for a firstborn male. The presentation of Mary in the temple is a different event that is not recorded in the Gospel. Instead, it comes from apocryphal writings, that is, sources outside the New Testament that expand on various gospel accounts. And as devotion to Mary flourished, uh, artists began to look to these sources outside the gospel to create works of art that celebrated in visual form the life and the faith of Mary, the woman God chose to bear his son into the world. Jem, tell us about this image from the National Gallery of Art. Sure, Tracy. You know, this beautiful painting from the year 1400 is one of three small panels by Andrea Di Bartolo that depict the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This scene was one part of a large altarpiece 
In the center, we see the temple priest standing at the entrance of an enclosed space, framed in a blue ceiling, studded with golden stars. His hands are open to welcome the young Mary. And behind him is an altar with an ornate tabernacle. The stars in the tabernacle evoke Mary's role as the star who points to Jesus, her divine son, and the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the word of God became flesh. We also see the haloed figure of Mary leaving her parents, St. Joachim and St. Anne. She carries the scriptures, the word of God, in her hand as she enters the temple where she will remain till her engagement to St. Joseph. And to give the scene a human touch, we see Mary pausing for a moment to look back at her parents with love and gratitude. And Jem, before we let you go, what's the takeaway for us as we celebrate this Marian feast day tomorrow? St. Joachim and St. Anne presented their daughter Mary in the temple in keeping with Jewish custom. But this child was different. God chose Mary and set her apart to bear his only son, Jesus, into the world. This 15th century painting, I think, reminds us that Mary's entire life, from her immaculate conception to her presentation in the temple to the Annunciation, was a preparation, an advent for that moment when God would come to dwell among us. Here Mary is presented in the temple where she is prepared to become the temple of the Lord, the mother of Jesus and our mother in faith. Well, Jim, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing this with us. Jim Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. And finally tonight, EWTN News Rome correspondent Colin Flynn brings us the story of a young surgeon studying in Copenhagen, Denmark. Her family fled their home in Bosnia to escape the war, but starting over wasn't easy. She shares how her faith carried her through every hardship. Matea Leiden is training to be a heart and lung surgeon here at the Copenhagen University Hospital. For as long as I can remember, I've been dreaming of being a doctor. Leiden and her family fled from Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1991 after the collapse of communism. They came to Sweden as refugees and got accommodation in one of the worst neighborhoods in the city of Malmo. We came as refugees. My the, the parents didn't have an education here. They didn't know the language and uh, you never really felt 100% at home or Swedish. Leiden was attending a struggling school in the neighborhood where the idea of a student going to become a doctor was unheard of. I went to these, if you can call them ghetto schools, and then to become a doctor I had to go at a good uh, high school, of course. And so I applied for the best in Malmö. And I remember when I came to an information meeting with my mom and I said, like my background, where I studied now, where I was from, he said, uh, I don't mean to offend you, but maybe you should go for a nurse or sub-nurse. What did that feel like when they were telling you to your face that this wasn't the high school for you? And I like when people underestimate me. Then I like to prove them wrong, and it makes me a hard worker. And underestimate laden they did. Despite her background, she was accepted and enrolled in one of the best high schools in Malmo, where she started to excel in her schoolwork. And it was on a trip to World Youth Day in Germany, 2005, that she discovered the faith. I remember one day when we were sitting in church and everybody was talking and making a lot of noise. And a monk, one of, in the Swedish group said, don't you understand that you're sitting in front of what you're sitting in front of and showing so little respect. And he talked about the tabernacle. And that was the first time I actually understood what it was about. And I really, it's hard to explain, but I knew it. I knew what it was, and that it was the truth. After graduating high school with straight A's, she went on to study mathematics and physics, then medicine at the University of Copenhagen Hospital, where she now works, her faith giving her strength and meaning in the work that she does. Of course it's hard if somebody asks you, why did my daughter have to die? I've seen young kids die in drowning accidents and car accidents. Of course it's hard to explain especially for someone who doesn't believe. Without dark, you can't appreciate light. In Copenhagen, Denmark, Colm Flynn, EWTN News Nightly.
And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.